Hi again, everyone. Um, let's just jump right into scripture this morning. If you have a Bible with you or can find one kind of scattered around the sanctuary here, um, turn with me to Matthew 25. We'll start in verse 31. We're going to look at the sheep and the goats this morning. So Matthew 25. I hear some pages turning. I'll give you a second to get there. <clears throat> So this is Jesus talking to Matthew 25, and he says, When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a, sep as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me, and I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let's pray. God, these are tough words from the mouth of Jesus. Um, and we ask that you, you show us your grace in these words, and you show us how we are to live in these words, um, so that we can be more and more transformed into your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So I've been doing this project of reading through the Bible in a year, and I'm in this weird place right now where I'm actually behind in the Old Testament and ahead in the New Testament, because I, I just kept going in there, and I couldn't handle more rules about what to put in the tabernacle and those kinds of things. So, <laughs> so I got to this passage in Matthew 25, and it just kind of shook me this week. It just kind of stuck with me. And it's not that I've never heard it before. Actually, when I was little, I loved Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. Do you remember those things from the 70s and 80s and 90s? And so anything in the Bible about sheep or shepherds or anything like that, I just grabbed onto those stories. I didn't really understand them at all, but they had sheep, and I liked Lamb Chop, and so it worked for me. But <laughs> so I've heard this story all kinds of times, but this week it just hit me and shook me up a little bit. Um, and I wanted to share with you this morning what what I think God is saying through this passage to us today. Um, and I think the reason it hit me is we're in this, this time and this place at Harbor Church where we're, we're going forward with some new and exciting and scary things. We have members for the very first time. Next week we'll be voting for our elders and we're, things are changing and things are growing and moving forward. And it has me asking a lot of questions like, what is the church and what is Harbor Church? And who are we? And who are we supposed to be? And who are we for? And I think this passage answers those questions for us. Maybe in ways that kind of surprise us. Maybe in ways we don't like all that much. But I think it's a really important answer for us to look at at this point in our lives at Harbor Church. So that's what we're going to do this morning. First of all, I think Jesus says in this passage in Matthew 25 that the church is us. You know, that question of what is the church, who is the church, the church is you, and the church is me. A about a year ago, I posted a graphic on Facebook, which very quickly became our most 
liked, most shared, most um, commented on Facebook post ever, and I think it stays that way. Um, there was this graphic that talked about the, distance, the difference between a consumer church and a missional church, or a church with a purpose, with a mission. So actually, Tim, if you could throw that up on the screen for me, you might remember this. If you can remember Facebook a year ago. <laughs> but I love this graphic. Um, it's such a helpful, I think, distinction between what we could be and what it's easy to be and what we should be, what God is calling us to here in Matthew 25. So it says there's, there's a consumer church on one side and a missional church on the other side, and the consumer church is kind of defined as a church that's seen as a dispenser of religious goods and services. People come to church to be fed, to have their needs met through quality programs, and to have professionals teach their children about God. And that's different from the missional church on the other side, where the church is a body of people sent on a mission. That's the key phrase there. A body of people sent on a mission who gather in community for worship, for encouragement and teaching from the word, in addition to what they're self-feeding themselves. Kind of a redundant phrase there, but in addition to what they're feeding themselves throughout the week. There's a consumer church and a missional church, but the key and my favorite part are those black bubbles on the bottom. I go to church versus I am the church. Do we, Harbor Church, believe that we just go to church, or are we the church? <clears throat> Matthew 25, I think, makes clear that the church is not a place. It's not an address, or a building, or a room. It's not this crazy old dance hall that <laughs> is on the corner of 92nd and 11th, a block away from Dick's Burgers. That's not the church according to Matthew 25. And the church is not an event. It's not what happens on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's not a program we can choose to attend or not attend. The church is a people who feed the hungry and clothe the naked and care for the sick and the poor. The church is a people who know that whatever we do for the least of these brothers and sisters of Christ, we do for him. That's what the church is. We do not go to church. We are the church. There's a big difference between those two. Matthew 25 calls us to really radical ways to live out church. To get out there and to, to act out church to share the love and the hope and the community of Christ that we all love and cherish in this place with those who don't have that yet. That's what it is to be the church. And it completely changes how we live, doesn't it? It completely changes how we live and act and have our being in the world. If I am the church, my life needs to be more than just a compartmentalized Sunday morning kind of religion. I need to live every day, every moment as the body of Christ, as the church. Jesus calls us to live lives as he lived. That's what it means to be the church. Not a program, not a place, not a time slot on Sunday morning, but each and every one of us is the church. So the church is us. <laughs> And this is the part that might be a little bit tough, <laughs> a little bit of tough love from Jesus here. The church is us, but the church is not for us. This is part of the answer that we might not like so much. So, but, but hear me out. So in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the disciples. I know we have some kind of Bible experts among us. So you, some of you probably know already the Pharisees were kind of the religious experts at the time. You know, they were part of the religious institution. They knew who to talk to, how to act, which laws to follow, what worship services to go to. They kind of had it all wrapped up, they thought. And this is Jesus kind of shaking up their perceptions of what they thought they had all wrapped up. So there's one group of people. On the other side, you have the disciples. Of course, those 12 young men that Jesus called to follow him. And this is close to, to Jesus' death, actually, when he's talking. So they've been with him for about three years. And we know that the disciples 
are who God would use to build the church after Christ went back to heaven. So in a sense, you have kind of an old guard and a new guard, right? The old way of doing church and the new church that God is building. And Jesus says to both of these groups, these experts in the beginnings of something new, he says, go out and share my love to those who are not like you. He says, go out and serve these brothers and sisters of mine. That's what Jesus calls them. Jesus is saying that this love and this grace, this good news of the gospel of Christ isn't just for those who have it all together, who have it all wrapped up. And it's not just for those who are already following Christ and starting something new. It's for everyone, even the sick and the poor and the imprisoned even for those who don't look like us. The church is not for us who are already here. And you notice in Matthew 25, there's, there's this active going out and serving that Jesus says is so incredibly important that he puts eternal significance on it. He says, look, to both the old church and the new church, it's not about you. This doesn't end with you. So go out and share it and spread it so that everyone can know and every tongue can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Go out and serve. And time and time again, Jesus shows us that the church is not about us. Our service and our inclusion and sharing the good news of the gospel has this very active and intentional component to it. Because you can't simply stumble upon someone who needs Christ and expect to give them what they need. We can't sit here in our nice comfy green chairs and wait for someone to come in the doors and call it outreach. That's not what Christ is calling us to here. He's calling us to go out. You and I, each one of us, need to go out intentionally and find those who are hungry or thirsty or naked or sick, to find those who need the grace and the love and the gospel of Christ so that we can to share with them what we have and what we know. In Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus says, I have come to seek and save the lost come to seek and save the lost. Now you notice, he doesn't just say, I've come to save the lost. That's it. He doesn't just say, I've come to wait for the lost to come to me so that I might save them. He says, I've come to seek the lost and to save them. Jesus went out to find those who needed his truth and his gospel and his salvation so that he could save them. And now he calls us to do the same. Do you see the difference? The church is not for us. Now, I want to be clear. When I say the church is not for us, I don't mean to downplay all the kind of us things that we do here at Harvard Church. It's important that we come together and pray for one another and hear what's going on in each other's lives and share meals together these things are important and they're, they're part of what God wants for us as his church. We do them because it's, it's important and beautiful and it builds us up and strengthens our faith. We need to do these things, pray for each other, hold each other accountable, encourage one another. But the reason, or at least one of the reasons we do these things is so that we can be transformed as God's missionaries and send each other out into the world having been encouraged and prayed for. Part of why these kind of us things that we do are so important is because they send us out, they shoot us out into the world ready to share the gospel of Christ. So if all we do here at Harvard Church is pray for one another or worship with each other or hear what's going on in each other's lives, we've missed half the fun. <laughs> we've missed the boat if that's where it ends. We need to do these things so that we are transformed more and more into God's people so he can use us in his work in the world. 
That's what they're for. Because we know, as Christ said, when we do these things, when we go out and when we serve and share the truth of Jesus Christ, we do it not just for those who we reach, but also for Christ himself. So we are the church, and the church is not for us. And also the church is a tool for God's work in the world. I found this really great quote from an author that I really admire named Alan Hirsch. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's, he's kind of become quite a, kind of a big name in um, especially in newer churches like ours and talks a lot about this importance of going out and reaching out. So in an article that he wrote for Christianity Today a couple of years ago, um, Hirsch wrote this. Because we are the sent people of God, the church is the instrument of God's mission in the world. As things stand now, many people see it the other way around. They believe that mission or outreach is an instrument of the church, a means by which the church is grown. Although we frequently say the church has a mission, perhaps a more correct statement would be the mission has a church. In other words, the church is a tool for God's work in the world. I love this quote from him. See, God is at work in the world already, and he's called the church to be his hands and feet in that work, to be the instrument, the tool for that work. Now, I'm the pastor of outreach here at Harbor Church, and I admit, I stand before you and confess <laughs> that I have sometimes fallen into this idea that outreach is a tool we can use to grow our church, right? It's a means to an end, and the end is that our church gets bigger. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I was talking with someone, and we were talking about the budget of Harbor Church, which most of you probably know isn't as large as we'd like it to be. <laughs> um, and, and I said, you know, this is why we need to keep reaching out so our church can grow. And the implication, of course, was, and growing will balance our budget. That's completely the wrong reason to reach out. We don't reach out to grow the church, just to grow the church. We don't reach out to balance the budget, certainly not. And it was like, God smacked me on the head and I realized I got it all wrong. <laughs> we don't do it to, to balance our budget or to reach out. We do that because that's why we exist. We reach out because we, we are God's hands and feet in the world. And that's why he's called us together. That's why he's created the church so that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and know that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the whole point of our existence. The church is the tool for what God is doing in the world. Too often I think we, we treat outreach as just one area of ministry. You know, we've got our great worship ministry and prayer ministry and some growing discipleship ministries and great children's ministries and a couple outreach things on the side. But what scripture shows us is the church exists to reach out. That's our whole existence. Worship and prayer and discipleship and growing up our children are so that we can make disciples alongside us. They all exist to strengthen us and empower us and to send us out to share the good news of the gospel. We've talked before about the Great Commission here in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not called the Great Commission because Jesus did a really good job with that. <laughs> It's not called the Great Commission as opposed to the Small Commission or something like that. It's called the Great Commission because it's our job. That's our job. Like a person commissions an artist to paint a portrait, so God has commissioned the church to go and make disciples. That's why we exist. Matthew 25 gives us this kind of tough love look at what we're called to do and puts eternal significance on this calling. Those who follow God and follow his call are his friends, and those who don't, it says, are the goats. <laughs> it's hard, and it's scary, 
and it's what God has for us in our lives and in our lives together as a church. So Harvard Church, will we be sheep or will we be goats? Are we a consumer church or are we a church with a mission? Do you go to church or are you the church? Will we take this challenge and follow God's call to go out and make disciples? Or will we miss the boat? That's the question that I leave with you this morning. Let's pray. God, use us. We want to say together this morning, here, here I am, send me. Show us how you would have us serve and who you would have us serve as we go forward together at Harbor Church. And use us as your servants in your work in the world. In your name we pray. Amen.